Hi, welcome back. It's Gerald Major, and we're back with hashtag C Arthritis, um, reporting live from this year's Canadian Rheumatology Association Allied Health Care Professionals Annual Scientific Meeting. Um, it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to be sitting next to this gentleman, Dr. Carter Thorne, who I've known now for probably three and a half years yeah, or so. Indeed. Um, and uh, we're just talking about uh, mindfulness a little bit. Mm -hmm. So are we going to kind of start with a little mm, <laughs> getting the right frame of mind, but uh, wonderful human being. And uh, I'm going to give you the chance to introduce yourself and okay. talk a little bit about... Uh, Thanks, Gerald. It's, it's always a pleasure to join your, your broadcast. My name is Carter Thorne. I'm a rheumatologist in Newmarket, Ontario. That's just north of Toronto. It's the, the city north of Toronto, okay? And we're very blessed there to have an excellent program in support of patient care, and, and that's been developed and uh, results in improved outcomes for our patients. And we're here to share our information with our colleagues, physicians, allied health professionals, and the patients who are here. Yeah, so um, you, you spoke briefly about models of care. I know you as, mm -hmm. you know, one of the founders of model of, models of care. Um, and as a patient um, who has excellent physicians, um, I often admire the people that have gone through the extra effort. Um, a lot of this time really is not compensated to put together uh, a foundation and a framework that works for patients. So explain your model a little bit. You know, you know we talk often of patient-centered care. We've, we've evolved that in the patient-partnered care. Right. And you can have patient-partnered care when you share information, when you share decisions. And the other f part of patient-partnered care is that the, that the responsibility is now twofold. Right. I have a responsibility, my uh, health care provider colleagues have responsibility, the patient has a responsibility to help us in their care. So our patient partnered care model or construct is indeed facilitated by a model of care, which again for us is just good clinical practice. Right. Right. And a model of care is just a way of describing bringing people together, patients with their needs. And in our particular model of care, we not only look after inflammatory joint disease, osteoarthritis, right. osteoporosis, right. Uh, chronic pain syndrome, fibromyalgia, and we do this with an interprofessional care team. Again, a new word, not multidisciplinary, but interprofessional. An interprofessional team shares constructs, shares what we call competencies. So the, though the pharmacist has a skill set in talking about medications and the right. physio, in the exercises and the OT and making a splint, as a, for instance, dietitian, social worker in their areas, they all have the same competency of, of looking at an individual and with them assessing how they're doing so that they can share it with the, with the rheumatologist in this case. And then we have this group group allowing us to provide timely service by the right person at the right time. Right. And this makes a big difference. So the big things that I've seen at today's meeting, uh, this week's year's meeting that resonated with me is communication and collaboration. Um, so, we just had actually a unmet needs of psoriatic arthritis mm -hmm. um, panel out there and um, lots of talk about patient groups. So I bring this up again and, and I know you're a big fan of patient groups and the, um, and the support that we provide, but um, so how does, you, you mentioned the patient's role, I can put this down, um, you mentioned the patient role and, and I agree, I'm a patient that um, I trusted my doctors early on. I had great doctors and I put my trust in them and I tried to worry about my career and, mm -hmm. my, and managing my disease. Um, then I started becoming an empowered patient um, and it makes all the difference yep. in the world. We talk about uh, interdisciplinary care, we talk about shared decision making, um, we talk about holistic therapy. Uh, and I'm living proof that it takes many different things mm -hmm. to be able to um, fire at the right time. So for me, my exercise and nutrition has to be solid before my outcomes will improve. Okay. Um, so talk a little bit about um, patients with arthritis that come into your clinic that are dealing with, you mentioned pain management, you mentioned uh, physio. So mm -hmm. how has those ads in your clinic uh, impacted yeah. patients? So one of the things that, that we identify and share with our patients is that every person has a, has a unique need. 
even if they're all listed in this particular room today as rheumatoid arthritis or spondylitis, osteoporosis with a recent fracture or whatever, uh, but we do also understand that if we take groups of people with rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory joint disease or groups of people with osteoarthritis or groups with the chronic pain or fibromyalgia or osteoporosis, that they will have in general similar kinds of needs. Right. And so when we talk about that, we, we ad, ad, ad address our programs for those particular needs. In a disease such as inflammatory joint disease, psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, medications have a tremendous benefit and measurable and they avoid damage if they're done properly and completely. In other diseases, <clears throat> excuse me, such as osteoarthritis, unfortunately we don't have medications that slow that progress down at this time. We have, medica we have strategies, and as you've already indicated, they are not medication. Right. They are, in the case of osteoarthritis for weight-bearing joints, it's weight reduction exercise. Those are the two that have been shown to be effective. So we try and be evidence-based, patient-partnered, patient-sensitive to what they need. So indeed, a person can have rheumatoid arthritis and have osteoarthritis too. Right. And today, their problem is osteoarthritis. Another day, it's rheumatoid arthritis. And having the ability, the skill set, is what I'm trying to say, of the members of our team, uh, that is a shared competency, as I mentioned, allows us to be very clear and specific. So giving, uh, changing therapy for rheumatoid arthritis for increasing knee discomfort related to right. a sports injury or you know, fam uh, family tendency towards osteoarthritis of a weight-bearing joint is not gonna help that joint. So really clear to be sensitive to what's driving the patient's symptoms. And there you can be more effective. And one of the things we've learned in our participation in CATCH, the early arthritis cohort, is that our patients tend to do really well do well with less need to change medication and less changes of medication. And our outcomes is good, are as good as or better than others. And we say that with humility, but also with pride. Right. And one of the reasons we participate in clinical research is because we're striving to be the best we can to make our patients the best they can be. So our little tagline is the best life you can live. That's, we, we look forward, look forward to that. Yeah, that's just beautiful. And you should have a lot of pride in that. Yeah. Um, so from a patient perspective, I mean, what this does, and you've likely noticed, but um, any time that I will have to go elsewhere for something mm -hmm. probably decreases the, ri the, uh, the likelihood of me doing that something mm -hmm. dramatically, right? So um, being able to address all of these different complications, because as you know, with inflammatory arthritis in, in particular, um, the list of complications yes. and comorbidities uh, just gets added on. Uh, in our re recent survey with the Canadian Spondylitis Association, I think I logged 12 different comorbidity or complications, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know what I'm going to get every day from my AS and from my PSA. Uh, what I don't know what I'm going to get is from all of the other stuff, right. right? And which three or four of those are going to be firing on which day. Um, so speak to what you're noticing with your patients that are coming in on complex cases with fatigue, with pain, and all these. I mean, the term that I most resonate with is disease distress. So mm -hmm. I would assume you have some people coming into clinic in disease distress, um, and being able to take care of them under yeah. one program. That's right. Um, the important thing, as you've already alluded to, is, is that, the, and I mentioned uh, briefly earlier, is that shared competency, competency that I mentioned is also about shared messaging. And, and as you've suggested, oftentimes our community, our people in our communities have to go to different providers that provide different right. messaging. And that gets very confusing. And it's important that the physio be able to tell the, the person with arthritis that their medications are important and that the pharmacist be able to tell the, the person with arthritis that their exercise is important or weight reduction or things like that. And, and, and this comorbidity story is very important. When I first started practicing, but if we speak of rheumatoid arthritis as the example here, patients were 35 years old. Right. So they were usually uh, female, as you know from that older description, they were of childbearing age. They didn't. They weren't sick. Like they, right. this was a new thing for them. Right. We only had to talk about your disease. 
Now they're, they're 57 years old, males and females, hypertension, diabetes, yeah. overweight, all yeah. that kind of stuff, blood tests are a little bit abnormal. These are all pieces. So every team member is conscious of comorbidities because they impact on our life. You come in and say, I feel like crap today. Now we have to determine whether that feeling of less wellness, right. distress, right. is disease related, medication related, right. because we also are, uh, emphasize this issue of you know, the adverse effects of non-treatment. Right. And those are the disease effects that you alluded to earlier. And so uh, our pharmacists, when, when they are able to counsel, and we do counseling two ways, one in, in, the, in a group setting in terms of our therapeutic right. education programs, and then the one-on-ones. But those are not as important as the phone calls we get. Right. And we tell our, our, our folks, the people that share our program, uh, that when they have a concern, whether it's something that's personally affected them or they've heard something that is disconnected or discordant from what they have heard from us, that they should come to us because our team are experts in arthritis care. Right. And, and, and to your point, that avoids confusion. It avoids, it reduces fear. I have my team behind me right. and I don't have to, I can, I can receive your information because it's probably well-meaning it's incorrect, I believe, and, and come back to the source. And I think that's a valuable service we have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I've been able to see in, in the short time frame that I've been here is, um, is change. Mm -hmm. um, and you alluded to it a little bit on the, uh, and, and you had a new term for it that I haven't heard is patient partnership. So where is the where is the role in models of care for patient groups? So what we have done because you know some of our groups aren't some of the patient diagnoses don't really have form, formal groups as such unfortunately. So in our program in our hospital we have, we have what are called patient family advisory councils, PFACs. Wow. So our program has a PFAC, and though uh, my uh, my. Ultra, what do we call it? Our, uh, this, my soulmate here, uh, Lorna Vane, our OT, is our director, and I'm the medical director. Uh, we started that, or we chaired it, and now our patients chair it. They set the agenda. We're just resources for if asked in, uh, information. They are resources because it's a patient partner. Right. Uh, as we developed our e-learning, the patient partner is involved, and we have a patient partner, not a patient a patient partner, not the patient right, partners right, right. Of, the, of the old days, <laughs> but a, a person who has actually experienced the program. Right. And they they cover the chronic pain, they cover off yeah. osteoporosis, yeah. osteoarthritis, inflammatory joint disease. So they've experienced, in one case, it's, a, it's actually the, the partner of the, of the person who has their arthritis because you, they, they, they felt so as a team that he would make more, more impact. So you've worked in the caregiver role uh, and, yeah. and the family. I yeah. mean, that's, that's yeah. something that we yeah. really, how long, how long has this been? We've been doing it a couple of years now. Because I mean, before this that, is well we had, before its be, time. I, I think before you that, know we that. have we've, we've been using patient ambassadors in all right. our programs. Right. They they always get into when we do the therapeutic education piece for those different topics I mentioned earlier. We always have a patient ambassador, someone who has walked that journey, right. where they came from, because everyone comes with lots of beliefs, misconceptions, fears, and we have to. We're trying to provide that hope that most people are looking for. I, I find a lot, <clears throat> I find a lot, I mean, with me, because I've had so many different uh, complications. My most recent was uh, collagenous colitis mm -hmm. out of surgery this year, and you know what that's like. So mm -hmm. when your gut goes, mm -hmm. you need to take notice. Mm -hmm. um, I reach out to other patients. I mean, that's where I get my information. I want to know what their experiences yeah. have been what they what foods they've avoided what mm -hmm. um, but um, you know on, on top of this I mean I think it's really important to recognize the fact that you've been doing you've been focused on the family and the caregivers of these yeah. families of people affected with arthritis and I mean I can speak firsthand my daughter loves when I mention her <laughs> name on she calls us TV right yeah, so yeah. Um, the other thing too is when daddy's on TV, that means daddy knows what he's talking about. So, <laughs> That's right. Uh, hi Tessa, uh, hi Anna. I mean, these are my caregivers. This is my family, yeah. and you can imagine in my road since uh, 14 years old, 
uh, what a toll it's taken on yeah. them. So I'm glad to see that you're addressing it within, and you must have fantastic results and well, stories we do. coming. And, and in our therapeutic education workshop, again, one of the pieces we've always had is that you can always bring your partner in. It doesn't have to be the you know, marriage partner or whatever. Whoever is going to be your support, your social support. And then, but even with uh, notwithstanding that, we will have a separate one-off session, three-hour session, to explain what the what for for the the, the social support person, uh, what roles they play, what, what why your partner is having a rough time, right. Right. when those rough times can be identified, what your role is when those tough times are there, to try and as best as possible prepare the unit, the family unit, right. for the disease because it is a family disease as it were. Everyone experiences differently, but they all experience it. <coughs> as you pointed out. Yeah, and, and so I see and, and speak with quite a lot of patients. Uh, we do patient forums quite regularly. So, I mean, I, I speak with a lot of people. And <clears throat> um, what I find is that, um, you know, from a disease perspective, you have to understand that these people are experiencing something that they've never experienced Absolutely. before. Absolutely. Um, the amount of uncertainty right. of... Um, so your anxiety starts to ramp up, and I, I, I'm a clear indicator of something that's good for anxiety and bad because I can feel it, I can acknowledge it, and mm -hmm. um, and I've lived with it so long, for so long. So when something happens to calm my anxiety, then I know that that's a really good thing. So um, I can only imagine the uh, the impact that you're having on families in this community. Mm -hmm. um, Anita, do we have anything from? Uh, I want to mention Our the audience. I want to mention the AEC as well. Right. Yeah. Hi. Yes. So we have a viewer that was asking, what tips do you have for people who want to set up a clinic that's kind of like yours, where it's one and all, and all in one, and also <laughs> any tips for someone who wants to set up a patient family advisory council? Well, what we found, I'll start with the patient advisory council. So this is not. This is as new as, as Gerald has pointed out, and it's something that's come, becoming more common. Uh, sometimes I, I think it's kind of administrative. We have to do it, so here you are. And, uh, but in our sense, it's, it's something where we actually take lead, like lead from them, I should say. Uh, in terms of starting a new program, what we're trying to do, and I mentioned two things at the beginning, and, and one was communication, one was collaboration. And I want to mention a collaboration that we're working on now. So I used to do a lot of randomized controlled trials. That's examining new medications for effectiveness and, and, and safety for folks. Um, and because our patients are doing so well, we can't actually enroll in those studies. So right. now we work on clinical, what are called clinical trials, clinical practice trials. And, and uh, in that regard, uh, I have indicated earlier that we do pretty well when we examine ourselves against the other sites involved in these trials which are across Canada. And, and that's kind of interesting, but it's lacking one piece is not only does it make a difference, but is it cost effective? Because right. there are problems with resources, as we know. Yeah. So you have to demonstrate that. And right now, the Arthritis Alliance of Canada, in collaboration with the CRA, in collaboration with the Arthritis Society, in collaboration with CIHR, which is the federal funding body, in collaboration with CATCH, which is the cohort right. we belong to, is doing an economic analysis of models of care, as are present in the eight right. sites. Now, those are all different models of care, and I think that's really important that they be different, because no one has you know, uh, access, knowledge, a crystal ball of what's best or not. And we're looking for what is cost effective, what makes a difference. And uh, we're very uh, keen on that. It's being led by Deborah Marshall, a PhD a, a, a lady from uh, Calgary, who's director of the Bone and Joint Institute right. there. And she's very uh, phenomenal. And again, a collaboration with rheumatologists and, and uh, uh, epidemiologists and patients and things like that. So we're really keen on that. And that's just beginning. We should have some preliminary stuff in the summer. Uh, more stuff in the next fall, and by next year we should have stuff because we're using the data of CATCH. There's a collaboration. You don't have to collect the data. It's already there, and we're just doing some qualitative stuff, which is obviously very important uh, in understanding these things. So that collaboration will then allow us a tool for advocacy so we can go to payers. So the biggest challenge that our colleagues face 
when they desire to set up a program right. is that the governor, uh, whoever it is says, no, we have no money for that, and where's the proof? So we're gonna provide that proof, and I think that's, that's really key, and uh, those kinds of things. In Newmarket, uh, we have a, a great program, as we've talked about before, and of our own initiative, we're moving out, and we know in, in York region, we have, uh, I came there, was 250,000, and now there's 1,250,000, right. and that's still looking at the 1 million above us in, in Simcoe, Muskoka, and the 1 million to the left, and right. the 1 million to the right. So we're collaborating with sort of a north the GTA Excellent. circle, from sort of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Markham Stouffville over to Brampton, and we've actually picked up some folks from Hamilton, because we've developed this e-learning module. So part of our, instead of all this, sitting in a room in a group, which is still very important for you know, chatting, because as you say, the sharing is really important right. for giving right. people confidence. Uh, so we're gonna develop this model and uh, as sort of this uh, beacon and spokes kind of right. thing, eh? And so we can share it beyond our borders and uh, at least get a sense of and do research on whether that gives effective care. So we're trying to spread that uh, and we like to call ourselves a, local, a regional program, a national resource, because we, we've done so much work and we want to share that work and share that benefit with as many people as we can. I mean, it's also a center of excellence, yeah. really. Um, anything else? Uh, no? So I, I think from this, what I want to say is, um, you know, on behalf of patients across Canada and, and beyond, um, thank you so much for your dedication and passion over the years. Uh, you really do get it, uh, I mean, from an advocacy perspective and a patient perspective, when you have a non-patient advocating in the way that you do, it's, it's really special and it can be more effective than uh, me advocating for my disease. So, well, together, um, together we're certainly stronger. And, and I, we need to recognize again that this is an arthritis community that is built around collaboration and, and trust. partnerships and trust. and. Um, you know, and, and the end goal is the same as the patient and better outcomes. So, um, just to finish, why don't you give us uh, your interpretation of what building bridges means, which is the theme this year for the CRA? Well, the two things that, that I've been most impressed with, I did, uh, there was a couple of communication sessions that I attended. One was for Indigenous populations. Right. And uh, I, I've had the, the privilege of working with indigenous population when I was working in Kenora, doing a clinic in Kenora. And that has really informed me right. very much on working on the, the, the diverse population we have in the North region. Right. Lots of different beliefs and systems. So it's, it's, it's but it, particularly for this group, uh, <clears throat> it's given me some insight in, in how to care for people in a different way, in a more humble way. At the same time, we had another speaker uh, who was talking about other thing, uh, other ways of sharing information, being open with patients in body language. So not language, right. but right. body language. Right. And I think that's so important. And we actually try and use as many of those tools, non-medicinal tools, right. Right. to engage the yep. patient, encourage them, give them the hope, give them the trust. So those two pieces... And then the collaboration that we just spoke of with regard to the AC, I think that kind of stuff, which brings together a number of initiatives from, from uh, manpower right. to research to getting data that we can use for advocacy. Right. And that kind of, all, this, all these uh, un unique things are now coming together. We can say, oh yeah, that all makes sense. When you started with all these, some of these projects began five or ten years ago, you said like, wow, what's going to happen right. with this? So many things in research are not translatable to improved right. care. Right. And we, the, our, our, our challenge and our success has been that some of that translation. In CATCH, for instance, that early arthritis cohort, uh, five or six years ago, there was quite a, a difference in, in clinical outcomes between the sites, even though all the patients right. began the right. same. Right. What we've shown more recently is that there is much more homogeneity. You come in tough you get better at the same rate. Now we're working in the middle. Right. How did you get there? Is there, is there a most effective way of getting there? <clears throat> most effective and safe. Most effective, safe, and cost effective. Right. Right. Because it's not the cost per se that makes us better, it's the use of the medication. Right. And I think we're, we're gonna learn a lot from this, this particular collaborative project. 
Well, thank you very much, my friend. And, Thanks, Gerald. Uh, it's I my pleasure. I can't wait to talk to you next year. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Well, that went well.